out. Even computer-based, socially distant school is over. But that doesn't mean we should stop learning. So I decided this morning we could have a math lesson. You may say, oh, Al, we didn't come here for a math lesson. We came here for a Bible lesson. Well, do you know when the first math lesson was mentioned in the Bible? Do you know? Anybody? When God told Adam and Eve to go forth and multiply. Well, math is an important part of everyday life, even in the life of the church. So here are some examples. How many church people does it take to change a light bulb? Well, it depends on the denomination, you know. For charismatics, only one, because his hands are always up in the air, and he's ready to change that light bulb. How about Pentecostals? It's 10. One to change the bulb, and nine to pray against the spirit of darkness. Okay, Presbyterians, none. Lights will go on and off at predestined times. How about Roman Catholics? That's also none. Candles only, and they must be approved by the diocese. How about Baptists? How many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, at least 15, one to change the light bulb, and three committees to approve the change and decide who brings the potato salad and the fried chicken. How about Episcopalians? Well, it takes three, one to call the electrician, one to mix the drinks, and one to talk about how much better the old bulb was. Mormons, it takes five, one man to change the bulb, and four wives to tell him how to do it. How about Unitarians? I didn't say Christian churches. Unitarians, we choose not to make a statement either in favor or against the need for a light bulb. However, in your own journey, you, if you have found that light bulbs work for you, you are invited to write a poem or compose a dance about your light bulb for the next Sunday service, in which we will explore a number of light bulb traditions, including incandescent, fluorescent, three-way long life, and tinted, all of which are equally valid paths to luminescence. How about Methodists? That's undetermined. Whether your light is bright or dull or completely out, you are loved. You can be a light bulb, a turnip bulb, or a tulip bulb. Bring a bulb of your choice to next Sunday lighting service and a covered dish to pass. Nazarenes, it takes six, one woman to replace the bulb and five men to review church lighting policy. Lutherans, none. Lutherans don't believe in change. And the Amish, what's a light bulb? So, we see that math can be somewhat of subjective when it comes to different denominations, but there is one mathematical truth which all true Christian churches agree on. That is that one plus one plus one equals one. The world may call that bad math, but we know it's good math. It's very good math. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit equals one God. It's not bad math, it's good theology. If we're honest, and of course, good Christians are always honest. If we're honest, we admit that we don't exactly understand the Trinity, but today is Trinity Sunday. So we're going to so try to solve that confusing math problem. One plus one plus one equals one. The Athanasian Creed is considered to be the best summary of the doctrine of the Trinity. It seems to have been written primarily to refute heresies involving the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. We will read it in its entirety in a little while, but for now, I will read the first sentence. We worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons or dividing the divine being. If you're a whole lot smarter than me, maybe that's explanation enough. But for me, for me to understand, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to break that down a little bit. Let's start with the three truths that make up the doctrine of the Trinity. And while we're at it, we'll cite some scripture verses that support those truths. Truth number one, God is three persons. We get our first hint in Genesis when God said in Genesis 1 verse 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. The use of the plural here is no accident, and God did not speak like the Queen of England. We are not amused. There was no convention like that in ancient Hebrew. The New Testament makes the three persons clear. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Truth number two. Truth number two. Each person is fully God. Referring to Jesus as the Word, John 1.1 1, 1 says, The Word was God. Jesus acted as God's equal when he exercised authority to forgive sins and when he commanded the forces of nature through various miracles. In talking to his Father in heaven, Jesus said in John 17, verse 5, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before the world began. Jesus told some religious leaders, before Abraham was, I am. That's John 8, verse 58. He had existed from all eternity as God the Son. Before Abraham was even born, 
Indeed, the reason the religious leaders gave for crucifying Jesus was that he claimed to be equal with God. And Jesus proved himself to be the Son of God in power when he rose from the dead. Remember, in John 20, verse 28, after Jesus' re re resurrection, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. So then the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is God. The Bible also shows that the Holy Spirit is God. The Bible's formulas for baptism and blessing include the Holy Spirit along with the Father and the Son. How could that be so unless the Holy Spirit is also God? The Bible often refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God. Some who deny the Trinity argue that the Spirit is not a person but is just a force, the impersonal power of God. But Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit as a person, as a comforter and an advocate. In Acts 5 verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Peter said, that lying to the Holy Spirit was lying to God. Elsewhere in the Bible, it warns, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. That's in Ephesians 4, verse 30. You can't lie to a force. You can only lie to a person. You can't grieve to a power. You can only grieve to a person. The Holy Spirit is not just a force. The Holy Spirit is a person, and He is God. The third truth, there is one God. The oneness of God is taught clearly throughout the Bible. Beginning in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Isaiah 46, verse 9, the Lord says, I am God and there is no other. The New Testament is just as insistent that there is only one God. In 1 Corinthians 8, verse 4 declares, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. There you have it. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. There are three divine persons, yet these three are somehow united as one. The inspired white writings of the Bible explain and confirm what the actions of God in history have shown, the reality of one God in three persons. So it is not that we don't understand math. It's that one God who has existed from everlasting to everlasting is much greater than we can imagine. We can read and understand the facts that we just reviewed, but there is no way, just no way, we can understand how on earth God makes it all work. Well, isn't that the point? There is no way on earth for us to grasp the entirety of this doctrine because it is not of this earth. It is of eternity which is another concept that is impossible for us to fully understand. I hope you agree, but if you don't, then I'm almost 100% sure your rebuttal will sound like this. The Trinity is like, that's how analogies start, and we love to make analogies, don't we? We'll look at some of the analogies that people use to explain the Trinity, but I'll tell you right now, 
They are all like a leaky pocket. They won't hold water. It'll be like we're up a creek without a paddle. It'll like we're between a rock and a hard place. You get the idea. So here are some popular analogies that we should reject because they are all wrong and can lead to heresy. Analogy number one. The Trinity is like an egg. In one egg you have the white, the yolk, and the shell composing one full egg. This analogy denies the unity of the Godhead. The problem with this analogy is that an egg yolk is of a very different substance than a shell. So the egg is made up of three distinct and unalike parts. This analogy actually teaches the heresy of tritheism. Tritheism denies the unity of the Godhead by saying there are three different gods. Tritheism denies that there is only one God. No person in the Trinity lacks any of the divine attributes, however. Each one possesses the divine attributes of God. Within the being of one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all are equally infinite in power, splendor, wisdom, love, and holiness. All are equally eternal, uncreated, without beginning or end. This is true because all three persons share the same divine essence. Analogy number two and three. Similar to the egg analogy, they are analogies of the three-leaf clover and the analogy of the hand, fingers, and palm. These analogies can also lead to tritheism or partialism, that is that God is made up of three parts or there are three gods, they're very similar. So since they represent those three different gods, this denies the unity of the Godhead. In addition, they are unable to function independently. Hmm. Analogy number four. The Trinity is like water. Water has three states, solid, liquid, and gas. Although the water changes forms, it is still H2O. Just as water changes forms, so too is the Trinity. This analogy denies the distinction of the Godhead. The problem with this analogy is that the water cannot actually exist as solid, liquid, and gas at the same time. As a result, the water must change forms. Not a single molecule of water can simultaneously exist in three different states. This analogy actually teaches the heresy of modalism. It says that the Trinity is not three distinct persons, but just different modes that God reveals himself to human beings. So under modalism, God acts as the Father in the Old Testament, the Son in the Gospels, and the Spirit in Acts and the Epistles. Modism, modalism teaches that one God just changes forms or modes over the course of Scripture. Modalism is a heresy because it denies the distinction of God. God does not change forms but exists as three persons in unity. In Scripture, we see the explicit Trinitarian references, especially at Jesus' baptism, 
where the Father speaks, the Spirit descends, and the Son is in the water. All three persons exist at the same moment in this story. Analogy number five. The Trinity is like a man who is a father, a husband, and a son. Although he, he is one, he has different roles to different people. The Trinity is like this man. The problem with this analogy is that it denies the distinction of persons in the Godhead. The analogy breaks down because the man in the analogy cannot simultaneously be a father, husband, and son to any one person. In reality, he changes his role depending on who he is interacting with. As a result, this analogy, like the water analogy, actually teaches modalism. My sixth example is a heresy, but not an, an analogy. I want to include one more Trinitarian heresy in our list, even though it isn't an, an analogy. It is the heresy of Arianism. Arianism is named after the heretic Arius, who was condemned by the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. He taught that the Son was at one point created by God the Father. His motto was that there was a time when the Son did not exist. Jesus then becomes a created being and thus less than fully God. Arianism clearly denies the deity of the three persons. Under Arianism, Jesus is less than fully God. I include it here because, unfortunately, Arianism is still around and can be found within the Jehovah's Witness teachings. Arianism denies the deity of the three-person trinity. I have one more Trinitarian analogy, and this one is not heresy. The Trinity is like the sun, that is the sun in the sky. The Trinity is like the sun. It's okay to wonder how it got there, but if you stare at it too long, you'll go blind. But if you accept it as a gift from God, you can bask in its life-giving light and warmth forever. So there you have it. One plus one plus one equals one. It's good theology and it's very good math.